Hi, and welcome back. It's Nick Costanzo again with Pastor Rich Kukin. Hi, Nick. Hi, Pastor. Welcome back. Thank you. So we're in the middle of a series on the doctrines of grace. That's correct. Today we'll be looking at limited atonement. That's right. Uh, but now, Nick, before we go too far, mm. uh, I, we have to confess that we really teased Kyle. I think it was the Valentine's yeah. time. We had our red sweaters yeah, on. We tried to find him a Valentine. Yeah, yeah. We were kind of kidding him. But in all sincerity and truth, and I want our, our listeners to know, this would not happen without Kyle. Absolutely. So, so he is our technological wizard. Uh, these, this is his studio. Uh, we could not do this without him. So after all the teasing we gave him, I think we should have him at least make an appearance. I think would so you agree? Too. Absolutely. <laughs> Kyle, would you mind coming around? Oh, uh, you don't have to say anything, but get where they can see you. Okay. Th- this is Kyle, everybody. Hello, everyone. And, and we praise God for for His gifts and His godliness. And um, and Kyle, you make us look bad. So can you go behind the yeah. camera again? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but thank you, Kyle, and and praise God again for your gifts and your your sacrifice and your dedication to uh, Relevant and Reform. We really appreciate it, and we, we appreciate you. So uh, so God bless you. But Nick, Absolutely. thanks for letting me interrupt. I had to get that off my chest. Since, oh, I don't blame you. Since yeah. the Valentine's Day uh, thing, yeah. yeah. So back to the topic. Back to the topic, <laughs> absolutely. We're going to be looking at limited atonement, which is the one most people buck hardest against. Yeah, Nick, they do. Uh, of the five that we've been looking at, uh, the five doctrines of sovereign grace, uh, five points of Calvinism uh, that I learned uh, with my Dutch heritage as the acrostic tulip, mm-hmm. total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. As you're saying, Nick, limited atonement is the one in my pastoral experience that people seemingly have the hardest time with. Um, especially if they are from more of an evangelical, uh, Baptistic, Arminian background. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason is, is because it gets at the heart of the question, for whom did Jesus die? And um, that seems to be the toughest. In fact, you may have heard of folks down through the years who claim to be four-point Calvinists. Yeah, and that's always the one that they reject. Generally, it is. It seems to be the one that they reject, and yet they don't realize that they all sort of rise or fall together, uh, that it's, it's sort of inconsistent to reject that one, but that is often the one that they reject. Very true. It really is, and um, many people reject it because it doesn't sound fair. Very good point. Uh, that's correct. It sounds like uh, what is lacking in Christ's sacrifice, or it really doesn't seem fair, um, and uh that gets us to the point, though, that what people may say or believe about it, or Nick, with all respect, what you or I may say or think or believe about it, really isn't the issue. Right. The issue is, as Paul says in Romans 4, 3, Galatians 4, 30, um, what saith the Scriptures? What does the Scripture say? And, and that's why we're doing these podcasts. We're really trying to delve into the Scriptures, supported by the Reformed Confessions, and, uh, and really get at the truth of the matter, even concerning this very, uh, called a delicate topic of uh, limited atonement. Or others call it particular redemption. I, I like that. You do. It's yeah. a little more uh, definitive as to what it really means. Mm-hmm. But uh, if you're up for it, Nick, let's go to the Scriptures let's then. If in. you're following, uh, let's go to uh, Christ's High Priestly Prayer. For example, uh, in John chapter 17, the gospel according to John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John 17. And Nick, I'll just start reading a few verses here, if I may, um, because it picks up on this critical doctrine uh, in a very, very important way. After Jesus said this, John 17, 1, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life, notice, to those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And then Nick dropped down to verse 6 of uh, John 17. Jesus' prayer uh, continues. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me. Remember that terminology, Those whom you gave me out of the world, they were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believe that you sent me. And then remember this phrase also, I am not praying for the world, critically significant, but for those you have given me, for they are yours." And so, Nick, uh, those verses initially, anyway, right away set forth the case 
that Christ died for those whom the Father had given him. He's not praying for the world. Think of that. Right. He's praying for those whom the Father gave him out of the world. And needless to say, these are not the only verses in Scripture that address this critically important topic of limited atonement or particular redemption. Yeah, definitely not. Can we go to John 6? Sure. Yeah, well, especially where we're in John right now. Yeah, we're, uh, right, let's, uh, we're sure. right there. Okay, let's go back uh, to John chapter 6. What verses are you looking at? I think John <clears throat> six thirty seven. Okay, is a really important okay. one. Okay, let's, and let's maybe go there. 44. Okay, Nick, take it away well. if okay. you don't mind. Yeah, thank John you. six thirty seven says, All those the Father gives me will come to me, and those who come to me I will never drive away. And if we jump down to 44. Okay. It says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. So you kind of get unconditional election paired with limited atonement. Yes, in the same passage, in the same passage. Um, While we're in John, uh, why don't we go over to the right, uh, that great chapter, it's John chapter 10, Mm. of uh, where Jesus presents himself as uh, as the good shepherd of the sheep. And um, Nick, why don't you read for us, if you don't mind. Let's drop all the way down to verse uh, 11 and take us through 15, if you would. Again, sure. and, and remember the theme we're focusing on. Sure. John 10, 11 through yes. 15. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. What an incredible What an incredible statement. I lay down my life. He doesn't say for the world. He says, I lay down my life for the sheep. Yeah. And start pairing that with those whom the Father has given me. And I pray not for the world, but for those the Father has given me. It really starts coming together. And Nick, while we're in John 10, uh, why don't we go right to the end? Uh, well, not the end of the chapter, but uh, further down in the chapter. Let's go to verses 27 through 30, if you don't mind reading that. Sure. My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Beautiful. And Nick, again, the uh, repetitiveness of the language Jesus uses about those who are his, his sheep. He lays down his life for his sheep. My sheep know me. They listen to my voice. They follow me. I give them eternal life. Uh, Salvation is a gift of God's amazing grace, of course, and his magnificent mercy. No one can snatch them out of the Father's hand. But that gets us into another topic we're going to be studying in a future podcast about no one can snatch us out of his hand. You want to take a guess at which doctrine that relates to? Oh, perseverance. Perseverance, of the, perseverance of the saints. But that's jumping ahead. Can we look at one verse right here? Uh, sure. Just yeah. sticks out at me as I'm yeah. looking down yeah. reading this. Yeah, great. It's John 25 and 26. Or oh, I'm, sorry, John- 10, I'm sorry, 10, 25 and 26. Okay, okay. Right before that, it yeah. says, yeah. Jesus answered, uh, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. Yeah. It's yeah. not that they're not the sheep because they don't believe. It's they don't believe because yes. they're not the sheep. What? That's a glorious insight. I've never made that connection before. No, that's a glorious insight. Um, while we're in the Gospels, uh, let's go back to Matthew chapter 1. Okay. All right. And again, if you're following along or listening, uh, if you want to just listen, that's okay. But otherwise, in Matthew 1, uh, Nick, drop down to verse, um, around verse 18, and you have this glorious account in the NIV. It's entitled, The Birth of Jesus Christ. And uh, I'm going to just read several verses here, beginning in Matthew 1, uh, verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, and now Nick underscore this, Mm. because he will save his people from their sins. Well, Nick, you start putting together these these biblical themes of Jesus saying uh, he's called Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. 
in John 6 and John 10, Jesus talks about those whom the Father has given him. And then in John 17, he says, I'm not praying for the world. I am praying for those whom the Father has given me. And when all of that kind of started coming together for me, I dug out a quote by uh, the Reformed Bible commentator William Hendrickson, uh, who says this about this, this theme that is woven through the several passages that we've looked at together. Hendrickson says this, and I quote, Between the purpose of the atonement and the purpose of Christ's high priestly prayer, there is perfect agreement. Now Mm -hmm. think about that. I'm going to read it again. Between the purpose of the atonement, why he came and laid down his life, and the purpose of his high priestly prayer, interceding on behalf of those the Father had given him, not on behalf of the world, between the purpose of the atonement and the purpose of Christ's high priestly prayer, Hendrickson said, there is perfect agreement. He actually accomplished his mission. He accomplished his mission. Amen. Amen. To this point of limited atonement, yes. in Matthew 11, we have okay. something that also sheds light All on it. All right, while we're in Matthew, hold on, let me get there a second. Matthew 11, what verse, Nick? 1127. Okay. It says, All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to wow. reveal Him. Wow, I've never really caught that text before either. Those to whom the Father chooses whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Yeah. Wow. There's a limitation. There's a particular focus in Christ's redeeming work. Absolutely. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Absolutely. Wow. Wow. And don't our Reformed confessions also deal with this? Yes, they do. Uh, in fact, I'll take my handy blue Psalter hymnal here. And uh, Nick, I don't know, you may have the, uh, I can the newer version this. with the uh, Trinity Psalter hymnal, a wonderful uh, book that was composed by the URC and the OPC together. But yeah, let's go to uh, chapter... F- um, Three would it be? Uh, excuse me. Article two of the um, of the canons that sets forth the five points of Calvinism. So let's go to Article two, and Nick, I'm going to read um, Articles three and five. Articles three and five. Of okay. The second main. Point. Yeah. So we're in the canons of Dort, second okay. head of doctrine uh, concerning the death of Christ and the redemption of men thereby. Article three. It says this: the death of the Son of God is the only and most perfect sacrifice and satisfaction for sin, and is of infinite worth and value, abundantly sufficient to expiate the sins of the whole world. Now, Nick, that is an extremely important confessional article because Reformed theologians like to say Christ's blood is sufficient Mm. for the sins of the world. It is efficient or effective, however, only for the sins of God's elect, those whom the Father has given me, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Now, uh, if you're there with me, let's go to um, Article 5, Article 5 in Second Head of Doctrine of the Canons. It says, Moreover, the promise of the gospel is that whosoever believes in Christ crucified shall not perish but have eternal life. Don't lose your place. Nick, sometimes we're accused in the Reformed faith uh, by others outside the Reformed faith of not being mission-minded or not being evangelistic or we are handicapped in our, in our preaching the gospel to the whole world. Far from it. The reason we preach confidently the gospel to the whole world is because we know there are those for whom Christ died and who, in whose heart the Spirit will work, bring them from spiritual death to spiritual life, and they will be saved. And so I love the confession. Moreover, the promise of the gospel is that whosoever believes in Christ crucified shall not perish but have eternal life. This promise, together with the command to repent and believe, Notice, ought to be declared and published to all nations and to all persons promiscuously. Not a word you'd usually find in a Reformed confession, promiscuously. It kind of has other associations in our corrupt and decaying culture, but that's what it says. It says this, this gospel call, along with the command to repent and believe, ought to be declared and published to all nations and to all persons promiscuously, meaning without distinction, to whom God, out of his good pleasure, sends the gospel. And so again... Christ's blood is sufficient for the sins of the world. It is efficient or effective, applied only to the, uh, to the sins of God's elect. Absolutely. He came on a particular mission, as you said earlier. Yeah. And he allows us to participate in getting the gospel to his people. Amen. And that's yeah. the glory of our, part of the glory of our Christian life. In fact, Nick, while we're um, on that subject, let's go back to the gospel of John just for a second. And let's go all the way to the account of Christ's um, crucifixion, John 19. And I'm going to set just a bit of the context of that critically important 
30th verse of John 19. Okay. I'm going to read, Nick, uh, verses 28 through 30. Okay, So John 19, picking up in verse 28. Uh, and Jesus here is being crucified. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was uh, there, and so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Nick, what that phrase, it is finished, says to me, and I know it does to you, is this. Jesus did not come simply to make salvation possible, hoping against hope that somebody somewhere, somehow, some way would come to believe in him. He came to lay down his life for his sheep, knowing that his once and for all sacrifice would accomplish the forgiveness of their sins, secure their eternal salvation by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and therefore he could say, it is finished. Not, I hope I've accomplished something, mm-hmm. with all love and respect you know, for, for the Lord in the scriptures. Not, I hope I've accomplished it. He said, it is finished, because he had accomplished what he came to do, lay down his life for his sheep. Absolutely. It's glorious. And it's amazing that, you know, some people don't, um, don't when, you, when you search the scriptures and apply the analogy of faith, that they don't come to understand that. Nick, I, I think I mentioned in a previous uh, podcast, this, this dear friend I had in New Jersey for many years, Frank Valeriano, big teddy bear of an Italian pastor, retired out in the Midwest to be with near his grandchildren. And Frank and I would talk about this, and we would debate this, and, and uh, he, was, he was harping on this limited atonement, as we said earlier, many people do. And I said to him one time, I said, Frank, think about this. If your theological view on, on the atonement is correct, and, and, he, and he was riveted, he was listening to what I was saying, I said, think about this. There are people in hell today mm. whose sins have been paid for. Yeah. And, and it, he looked like I hit him with a two-by-four. He said, Wow. I've never really looked at it that way before. But if Christ has paid the sins of everybody, well then, theoretically, there are people in hell whose sins were paid for. What kind of sense does that make? None. <laughs> right. And I think that there's a scripture that actually speaks to that, just popped into my yeah. head while we're yeah, sitting go. here. I, it's the famous passage of Isaiah 53. Oh, yeah. The very yeah. last yes, verse, yeah. Isaiah 53. Yeah, very good. Um, verse 12. It says, Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, yeah. and he will divide the spoils with the strong. Because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgression transgressors. Mm-hmm. And here it is. Yeah. For he bore the sin of many. Yeah. Not all. That's right. And made intercession for the transgressors. And actually, yeah. Jesus says that when he's yeah. at the institution of the you, Lord's you Supper. Just, you just, Nick, you know, I've said before that you and I are starting to think alike. And that's a little scary. <laughs> but um, he... he <laughs> where, where are you he, going? Because I'm well, going to Mark. I, I'm going to um, <laughs> Mark 10, verse uh, 44. Mark 10, 45, Jesus says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. For many. And ready? Here's one more. That's, oh, gee, okay. Mark 14, 24. <laughs> so we both thought Mark, but we went to different verses. Okay. 14, 24, the institution of the Lord's yeah, Supper. Yeah, okay, you had mentioned that. Okay. He said, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for yeah, many. Yeah, yeah. It, it's replete. In yeah. the scriptures, people have to study the scriptures, be open to the Spirit's leading of the truth of the scriptures, and not approach it with a preconceived theological position. But again, as I said earlier from Romans 4.3 and Galatians 4.30, what saith the scriptures? Yeah. And that's what we're trying to do here in, in these podcasts. And Nick, if I may share a, an illustration that I think, I think helps this. Um, you've heard of Dr. James Dobson. Of course. Uh, founder uh, of Focus on the Family. I think most of my spankings came because of jo- Dr. James Dare Dobson. to discipline and things yeah, like that? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Strong-willed child. Okay. I've read both of those. <laughs> okay. Um, well, anyway, Dobson once used this, this illustration. It had nothing to do with limited atonement, but it's a good illustration. He said there's a difference between men and women when it comes to shopping. Have you ever thought about this? There's a, there's a key difference. Here's, here's what Dobson yeah. says. You, okay, Dobson said when a woman goes shopping, she goes browsing. She's just browsing, find something she likes. Oh, they touch the clothing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. After looking in their closet and saying, I have nothing to yeah, wear. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So um, my wife does not say that, by the way. And probably Jess doesn't either. No, no, really. no. We're going to cover our wives. Um, but anyway, so Jessica, Dobson says... you don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Dobson says, when a man goes shopping, he's really going hunting. He's mm-hmm. really going hunting. He has in mind something he wants to get in, and find in that store, and he just goes and looking for it, finds it, and he gets out. And that's how, how most guys, I would say, shop, yeah. right? We really hunt. 
So um, the, the, the point I, I, I'm making with that analogy is that Jesus did not come in his incarnation and his sacrificial atonement, substitutionary atonement, browsing, hoping to find somebody who someday, somehow might believe. He came hunting. He came on a mission to accomplish the salvation of his people by laying down his life for the sheep. That's what he did. That's what he accomplished. And all glory be to God. Absolutely. All glory be to God. It's, it's a difficult but beautifully um, worded doctrine in the scriptures if you're willing to search it out and allow scripture to interpret scripture. Limited atonement, particular redemption. Christ accomplished what he came to do uh, and none of his sheep will be missing. Glory be to God. Now that's a great segue into our future episodes yeah. where, we'll, where we'll look at how that definite atonement should bring us comfort and assurance of salvation. Amen. Excellent point to be made. Thank you, Nick. Thank, Thank you, you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you for listening uh, to this episode. We'll be back next week with another episode. If you have a question for Pastor Kukin, please just drop it in the comments below, or you can go to our church website, which is PoconoReformBibleChurch.com, and you can go all the way to the bottom where there's a place to drop your question. Thank you very much. Thank you. God bless.